Welcome back to season three of the Total Confidence Podcast. We had to kick this season off right. I am honored to have with us a very, very special guest, Deborah Threadgill Egerton, MA PhD, as is an internationally respected psychotherapist, spiritual teacher, an IEA certified Enneagram practitioner, and a consultant and coach. Dr. E, as she, as she is affectionately referred to, is the founder and president of Trinity Transition Consultants, LLC. She works with individuals and organizations, both large and small, to help them release false historical narratives and to open their minds and hearts to a new idea, which is an acronym for inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. For more than two decades, the focus of her work has been teaching the Enneagram as a valuable tool for social justice and anti-racism and using it as a blueprint to reunite people. Her visionary approach to idea work expands the traditional scope of the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion method, and allows for the honoring of every individual with respect to all dimensions of their unique self-identification. She is a current board member of the International Enneagram Association, and her greatest passion is leading others to understand their own humanity. Help us welcome Dr. Deborah Egerton, Dr. E. How you doing, Dr. E? I'm good. How are you? Great, great. Excited to talk to you. Uh, enjoy spending some time and meeting you in person in San Francisco. And that was great. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. Oh, it, it, was, it was so amazing. So, um, and give my love to Walter, Dr. Walter as well. It was great meeting him as well. Before we go into your wonderful book, what I like to do here is to give our audience an audio portrait of our guests so they can understand the context of the ideas we're sharing. What inspired you, Dr. E, to become a psychotherapist? Well, I can honestly tell you that uh, from childhood, I was always fascinated with the way that people treated other people. And I can remember looking at people who um, I felt were harsh or unkind and wondering why they were that way. And then uh, I, I was naturally drawn to people who were kind and open hearted. And uh, as I grew, I discovered that, um, you know, the reality of the way that we treat one another has a lot to do with our own state of mind. Um, you know, we're either projecting things onto other people <clears throat> um, or we have picked up someone's energy. Uh, there are so many reasons that people tend to be less than kind. And I wanted to have a part or to make a contribution in the world that was focused on kindness, on trying to help people just become kinder and gentler and being able to see people as they are and accept them as they are. So of course, naturally as a black woman, you know, um, I was on the receiving end of a lot of, um, daily indignities, as I call them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that didn't make sense to me either. So ultimately, you know, I, I just felt the call to respond to working with people in terms of why are you the way you are? And is there anything that I can help to release you from the pain that you must be in? Therefore, you wouldn't show up the way you do in the world. Beautiful, beautiful. So you always had a sense of mission, it seemed oh, like. Always. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. How did you come to discover the Enneagram and what was your first impression of it? So the I had discovered the Enneagram uh, following that very same beautiful thread through my life uh, because when I was a um, psychotherapist on staff at the State University of New York. I had a lot, my caseload was primarily students of color, um, international students and students who came from various parts of the US, but students of color. 
and I was the only therapist on staff who was a person of color. Um, a lot of the students were being sort of diagnosed with uh, adjustment disorder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then, I can, I can say that some of the kids who were in the State University of New York came from areas of Harlem or Brooklyn or um, just places where, you know, what we call the inner city at the time, um, where they really didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were able to go on to college was amazing. So they would get to college and they would struggle because sometimes there were things going on back at home that were very difficult for them to <clears throat> balance the school with what was going on back at home. And those students would come to me and I would work with them. Often they just needed practical, logical solutions to life. You know, my, my mom and dad got picked up last night. My, my dad was dealing drugs, they took my mom to I've got three brothers and sisters at home. Do I stay in school or do I go, drop out and go home, and take care of, you know, the kids? And those are tough life decisions. You know, I, I know that um, even talking with you, you know, you would have an understanding of how people struggle because you work in that area all the time, you know, talking to people. And um, I wanted something on it that would help them beyond their 12 sessions of sitting for an hour with me. I wanted something that they could continue to do their own inner work. You know, with some of the students, I could take them back to their, you know, their spiritual roots, and we would talk scripture. Um, with some students, we would just talk about um, the universe and how it supports you. But ultimately, I wanted them to be able to dive deeper. And I picked up um, Wisdom of the Enneagram. Mm. And I started reading it. Yeah. Now, the, the funny thing about it is, this is very true for many of us, you know, you start reading something, you get fascinated, you put it back on the bookshelf, and you forget about it for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, uh, some years later, I ended up, you know, my, my husband is a retired a military colonel and a physician, but he was at um, Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and um, I went in to do some work with a team there, and I ended up telling them how to take care of each other. There were nine of them, and I gave them all the attributes that each of them had, mm -hmm. and every one of their attributes identified an Enneagram type. That's amazing studied it yet you know mm. uh, so I went home that night and I got online with the old-fashioned computer <laughs> trying to find something to do a search I found Riso Hudson was doing a um, class um, in Pennsylvania and mm. I signed up right away and I got in my car and I went and that was it that was it I was off <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing they mm -hmm. found you wow so you are an Enneagram activist and yes. I loved your um, opening address at the IEA conference in San Francisco and you told the, the, the story um, of what led to it. But can you recount that for us? Like what events led you to become an activist within the Enneagram community and subsequently led to the writing of No Justice, No Peace? Well, um, <clears throat> uh, I've been hanging around in the Enneagram community for a long time. And uh, I can, you know, I can honestly say I didn't meet a lot of people that looked like me. Um, and I kept wondering where we were, you know, where are we? This is, this is such a healing, you know, this is such a healing mechanism that we can employ in our lives. And why are there not more people of color, uh, particularly African Americans, coming through the door. Uh, but there was a incident, an actual murder, uh, in Minneapolis that year, and it was Philando Castillo. And um, 
when I was there at the IEA Global Conference that year, no one mentioned his name. And he had been murdered, I mean, literally walking distance from where the conference wow. was. Wow. And, um, the cab driver drove me by where it happened on the way to the hotel. And, you know, I, I recognized that something was amiss. Uh, usually I felt good coming to Enneagram conferences, but that year I was really uh, torn. So I almost didn't want to go. Um, I was grieving. And usually when you enter the Enneagram community, and you know this, you were there at the conference, you enter this wonderful bubble of mm -hmm. kindness and love and light, and you feel like, wow, if only the rest of the world was like this all the time. Yeah. Um, but that year, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel the kindness, the love, or the light. Um, I felt out of place. And I felt alone in my grief. And towards the end of the conference, uh, we had an, an open, there was a panel and people could come up and ask questions. And I just got up and asked the question, you know, look around you, where, where are the black people mm. color in this room? And um, I didn't really get an answer. <laughs> and at that point, I recognized that I, if that was in my heart, I could not put that on someone else to do. Mm -hmm. That's it. Where are we when I'm asking the question and I'm a person of color, I'm a black woman, what needs to happen here to make this community become more diverse? Mm -hmm. And that was the moment that I recognized that, you know, I'm an activist, you know, I go into organizations and I say, look, I won't work with the executive team unless I can also work with the maintenance crew, mm. Mm. you know, like, <clears throat> you know, doing the things that allow you to uh, open the doors and create access and opportunity for everyone. And that's who I am. That's what I do. And yeah, that was that was the moment that I started identifying as an activist. Awesome. Awesome. You shared an account in your book that nearly brought me to tears. Um, it's a, a trip that you took with your mother. You were five years old, yeah. Alabama. Yeah. Um, would you mind sharing that experience with us and it affected a head on both you and your mother? Yeah, that that's a, that's a tough one. Um, it's, you know, you would think that all these years later that it would have um, healed, and it is a wound that has kind of healed doing the work that I do has somewhat helped it, but, you know, there's scar tissue there. Yeah. And, um, uh, being only five years old and, you know, back then we didn't necessarily go off to uh, to school until we were you know, right about that age. And so this would have been before I was in school and exposed to a lot of the things that later would come to help me realize that, you know, um, as a black person, I would be treated differently. Hmm. And um, my mom and I were flying to see her mother who lived in Alabama at the time. And when we got into the airport terminal my mother put my put a hat on me and um she told me to go into the restroom take care of my business wash my hands and come right out and to be quick and the first thing i you know why aren't you going with me i said aren't you coming with me mama and she said no just go baby um so i went did what she said and i came out of the the bathroom there in the terminal in Alabama, and I couldn't find my mother. And then I looked again, and she was standing just right across the way from where she left me. Mm -hmm. uh, but she looked different, Donna. She she looked she looked um, smaller, and she looked defeated. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, the backstory of my mother is that she, my mother um, was an Enneagram 7 mm-hmm. with big energy, you know, bright, shiny, flamboyant, elegant, wonderful woman, mm-hmm. uh, a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> so I had never seen my mother like this. And, you know, she, um, she had taken off her hat. She wore a big hat. So she had taken off her head and she, hat and she was kind of, you know, head down, sunglasses off. And I walked over to her and I said, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, nothing, baby. Um, I just want to get out of here. Mm. And I looked at her again and, you know, she was crying and I had never seen her cry. And I, I said, okay, Mama, um, then let's go. And I took her hand <clears throat> and I led her outside the airport Mm. they are just actually changing planes and um we got outside she put her hat back on and her sunglasses back on and pulled herself back up to her full height and something that i remember about that day is that i felt for the first time the air of oppression Mm. you know it was just a hot humid smothering kind of sense but it was the it was you know it was the energy of the air and um i asked her i said mama are you okay now and she said yeah i said can i take off my hat and she said "Mm, not yet baby but soon well you know for your your listeners who cannot see me i'm a fair-skinned black woman Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if there was something that would give me away, it was my coppery, coily hair at the yeah. time. You know? Right, right. My mother did was put this hat on me, sent me into the white restroom, mm-hmm. and she stood outside as if she was my nanny, mm-hmm. so that she could, you know, sell the lie. And um, I know what it did for me was that I recognized that there was something wrong. There was something that took down my mother that Mm -hmm. day, Mm -hmm. brought her to her knees. And for me, it it made a lasting impression because I wanted that gone. Whatever that thing was, I wanted it gone. And for my mom, I think it was, um, it was, it was just so hurtful, so painful because we lived in New York Mm -hmm. and I hadn't really been exposed to anything like that. It was very painful for her to bring me south and to have that experience on the way to visit my grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, wow. You know, reading that really just brought back that reality that, you know, me born in 1977, grew up in the 80s, and, you know, we didn't experience the overt racism right. like that, you know. And so it just like it gave me a better understanding of you mm-hmm. and your work as well, um, because because it's not over now, it's easy to kind of fall asleep to it. So I really appreciate you. I know that was difficult for you to uh, to share, I'm sure, in the book and even now. So I appreciate you sharing that um, with us and our, and our audience. I've heard the word racism described in different ways over the years. In your book, you define racism as a power dynamic that perpetuates the attitudes and behaviors aligned with the belief that one group of people is to be treated with respect and deference based on the color of their skin and you go on to say this group holds the conscious or subconscious belief and has power over what they consider a lesser than subservient race of people wow what effect because again me growing up in the 80s um and even my children now it's a different world um what effect does has this had the effect of racism had on the psyche of first black people? Let's deal with that then and even now. Okay, so that is really important, Ahmad, because you have children. You grew up in the 80s. 
um, and you talk about racism as something that you know is there, but it's it's not as overt as it was um, when we lived in that separate but equal world, which was never true. It was separate, but it was not equal. Um, <clears throat> my husband grew up in the South in North Carolina. He did not go to an integrated school until he was a senior in high school. Wow. So, you know, and you've met us. We're not older than dirt, you know. Right. So right. Who, um, who are here now who can share with you uh, stories and things that have happened in our lives that many people would not think uh, are still going on. But when I look at what it's done to our psyche, it has actually created um, a bias that lives inside of us that says that we are less than. Mm. Mm. If, if you don't do the inner work to find your own self-worth, when you look at the reality of how systemic racism has kept us from living in decent neighborhoods, uh, kept our children from going to the best schools, kept us from generational wealth. I mean, all of these things that even the terminology, minorities, we are considered minorities. The language, the systems that got set in place, um, the lack of education, the food deserts that exist across the world, all of those things actually land not only in our minds, but in our bodies in a way where it says not worthy. Hmm. Now, depending upon who raised you and who, who taught you who you are, and whether or not you had an intact family or, you know, a, a real uh, a mama who was a powerhouse that raised you or a dad who, you know, worked three jobs to make sure that you were going to get a good education, whatever it took, kind of like what you're doing with your kids now. These messages went uncontested. So they were downloaded into us as a people came to this country in chains against our will. Our families were separated and torn apart. So how do we rebuild our sense of family and community? You know, we, we began to find that again in the churches. Um, and we had some great uh, leaders coming up that spoke out against any type of belief that we are less than. But what it has done to our psyche, we still see it playing out in black on black violence. We still see it playing out in broken families when the families are broken based on um, poverty, drug addiction, um, alcoholism, uh, things that would numb people to the reality of what is happening in the world, what is happening to them. Uh, so it, it's had a huge effect on how we have evolved. And I say to every black per person who breathes air, um, go inward, look at it. Find it, heal it. Mm. Test on it. It's called the Harvard um, Implicit Bias um, Survey, yeah. and you can go to uh, you can Google it, and you can go online. You can take the test, and when you take the test, even as a black person, you will be shocked at the results when it tells you and shows you your own bias when it comes to sort of the subconscious way that you think and feel about your own being. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, had, it's had quite a, quite a impact mm. on our progress 
as human beings. And one of the things that I would say, always remember the words of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, it is one thing to ask a man to pull himself up by his bootstraps, but it's cruel jest to ask someone who has no boots Ooh. to pull himself up by his bootstraps. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it's deep and we have to look at it. We can't go under it. We can't go around it. We can't go over it. We have to go straight through it. And we have to go through the pain in order to get to the other side to find out where that pain is in us and heal it. I, I, whew, I appreciate you saying that because one of my favorite words is context. And people sometimes without the context of knowing how it affects us, they buy into the inferiority narrative, uh, people from outside of our community and even some people in our community. So I, I say that I ask that same question about the psyche because you do diversity, equity, inclusion work. What effect has racism had on the psyche of white people? Well, you know, this is a, this is a, a real conundrum because the, the psyche of what I call the dominant norm. It has created a world where if you are part of the community of the dominant norm, which is white in our country, and in, you know, in all fairness, it's light skin, even in, in, in other cultures as well. You see that people with dark skin often have the subservient um, positions and, and uh, do the labor. But there's two things that I look at. And one is it leads to and has led to a sense of entitlement. Hmm. And that there's not enough to go around. So I'm going to make sure that me and mine get what we need to have. So those who are not willing to take the deep dive and look at what racism is doing to them as white people, that's equally as problematic for them. Mm. Because what I see is an erosion of, of, at the core of the character and the self of human beings who can perpetuate continually negative, hateful actions towards another group of people with no remorse mm. and no regard and no care, empathy, or compassion mm. for the outcome of those actions. And what I'm also finding is I recognize very clearly that when someone harms one of my children or my grandchildren, that it breaks my heart. Mm. If that happens at the hands of, say, a white woman's child, and there's no reaction or response, like it was okay to do that to that black child. It was okay to do that because to say nothing is to leave the space to be filled in with it's okay. If you don't speak out against it. What's happening now is I actually have white people coming to me with their children who are in their 20s or 30s who are angry with them Ooh. because Ooh. they now recognize that they grew up in this biased, bigoted world and they're holding their parents and their grandparents accountable. So Ooh. racism comes to everybody's door in some way, shape or form. The thing is, have you done the inner work be you black, be you white, be you whatever, to be able to respond and not just react when it happens. Mm. 
Wow. 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 Oh, uh, okay. Whew. That's that's heavy. Um you use two terms I've never heard in the context you use them in the book. What is um automatic advantage? And mm -hmm. then also othering. I never heard of othering before. Could you expound on what these terms mean? I can. So um we have a big challenge um when it comes to educating and opening up the awareness of people around what it really looks like when you talk about racism. And so, for instance, even if you do well as a black person living in this country, someone might look at me and my husband, we're both well educated, we live well, um, you know, we, we can we can get into most places without people acting all crazy. And that's not to say we're not still sometimes going to be given that that seat in the back of the restaurant by where, the, you know, the dishes get washed. Mm -hmm. and of course you have to speak up against those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm teaching people to try to get that three centered alignment and that full body, yes, I understand this. I explain that part of the problem of people not wanting to do this work is the language that we use. So the language lands in the wrong way, and then the defenses go up, and you have no opportunity to be heard. Hmm. The language of white privilege or white supremacy is triggering. So to people who may actually be trying to make a turn in the road, mm -hmm. maybe trying to become allies or advocates who have witnessed the things in the past, you know, decade now that really say, okay, black people, um, you know, Latinos, they, they all, they get treated kind of differently. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand how it has anything to do with color. So I explain that to be born white is to be born with an automatic advantage. Mm. If we look at someone like Bill Gates or Donald Trump, mm -hmm. you can actually understand how those children were brought up with more automatic advantages based on economic status. Absolutely. No, they, they, they weren't going to navigate too many hurdles in life that daddy couldn't pay for to get them out of or into whatever circumstance needed to be addressed. But automatic advantage is something that everyone has in some category. I try to help white people understand that one of the categories of automatic advantage for them is white skin. Mm. Because if you are a white person, you are not likely to be targeted the same way that you are if you are a black person. Because visibly, you can see a difference. And people can understand that. It's like, oh, okay. So if I go into a, a store and a black woman goes into a store and a Latina goes into a store and the security guard has to choose who they're going to watch yeah. to see if there's any shoplifting done, it's not likely to be the white woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but all of the things that we've seen where we use this, you know, and, and I don't like that we're, we're perpetuating more stereotypes. Now we have Karens, you know, yeah. and we talk about, um, but we've seen how a, a white woman can pick up the phone and call the police and be responded to and, um, you know, have a black man in these situations or whoever it may be that's a person of color on the other side. The white person will be believed 
the black person's life is now in jeopardy. Right, right. Well, I believe that you have to bring people along. So I unpack the language. Mm-hmm. Automatic advantage if you were born with white skin. White privilege, what people hear is you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you never worked a day in your life yeah. for any you have. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's not what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're about is the privilege of being able to navigate through the world unencumbered by doubt, fear, or malice. Mm. And that's very different. So if you can understand that being born with white skin into the dominant norm, the norms that create our culture in our society, then your life is likely to flow easier than it will if you're born into the norm that is not considered dominant yeah yeah okay now that's automatic advantage and remember i said we all have some um if you manage to get a higher level of education that's an odd that's an earned advantage but it gives you an advantage in life Some of us have automatic advantages. Some of us have earned advantages. And so we look at all of that terminology and where it fits in. And I actually get people to chart it. Um, Now, the other term that you asked about was othering. Othering is to treat people differently based on some aspect of their diversity that resides outside of the dominant norm or dominant culture. So um, this would include ethnicity. It would include um, sexual sexual um, orientation, gender identity. Um, it would include all of the different levels of age. Um, colorism gets in there. Uh, languages, all of that deep, rich mixture that, you know, I put up in my humanity mosaic. When you are treated as less than, then you are treated like an object. Mm. You are other. You are not you, me, you know, you're just other. You're not in relationship with the rest of the way it's really looked at is i don't see you wow i don't see you and you're not in relationship with me so this this concept of oneness that we talk about so much with the enneagram Mm -hmm. okay you're othered outside of the oneness Mm. you are placed outside of the oneness and I think that the work of people who know the Enneagram is really to bring people back in from the margins of society and to accept the necessary steps that we have to take to truly create inclusion and belonging. Ooh, profound. Wow. Ooh, okay. Yeah, uh, when you f- first began to bring your mission of diversity, equity, inclusion to the Enneagram community. How was it initially received? And how is it in the difference of how it initially was received and how it's being received now? <laughs> so I would, uh, <laughs> I have I have to laugh because, you know, you, you take the victories where you find them uh, and it takes time, you know, um, and, um, I've developed patience as one of my my strong suits, actually. Uh, I would present at the Enneagram conferences, and uh, I can honestly say, you know, a few brave souls would come in. Um, The room wouldn't be full. Uh, Periodically, there would be a strong ally who would come into the room and, uh, you know, sort of to, to... kind of say, you know, come here. You know, she's talking about some things we need to hear. Mm. Um, And back in those days, uh, Deb Uten would come in and bring other people with her. 
um, Russ would come in and other people would follow because it was Russ. Uh, Tom Condon would kind of stick his head in in the back and, <laughs> and pop in for a while and, and, uh, and disappear. Um, and I say that with a lot of love and, um, and, you know, just good feelings. Uh, B. Chestnut did everything in her power to encourage me and, and be by my side, you know, to help me. Um, so I, I and I'm, I'm going to stop naming names because there were so many people who wanted the message to get out there. Um, but when I look at from when I first began showing up in the Enneagram community and presenting in the Enneagram community and this year doing the the keynote speech at the at the global conference <clears throat> um the reception this year was a bit overwhelming i mean overwhelming in a good way yeah. um because the the book has been so widely and well received um and people are contacting me daily uh, just asking about different, you know, can you, can you, you know, give us a few questions for our book club, um, you help us explain, you know, different aspects of the book. So uh, I would say that the momentum has grown and people are waking up. And as they wake up, they're standing up. Mm. And as they stand up, they're actually reaching out their hands and their hearts and opening their minds um, to be a part of the equation, um, you know, to, to give voice to what is seen as being a travesty and, you know, terrible injustice and wanting for us to evolve to being a better species of human beings. Mm. Beautiful. As we uh, come to a close, because I'm always respectful, of the time um, that you're giving me and all my wonderful guests have. And I'm so thankful for your time, Dr. E. Um, you described the Enneagram as the most useful and underrated diversity tool on the planet. You described that in, in your book, No Justice, No Peace. What did you mean by that? The Enneagram is a great unifier. It is the great unifier. Um, and because particularly in the modern world, popular culture, um, we have so many ways of putting it out there. And not everyone goes deep, but people begin to understand how they show up. Now, if I'm working in a corporate environment and I take the CEO of that organization and have the executive team in the same training room, learning the Enneagram with the maintenance team. And then I break them out by, you know, what we call type, but I actually call it energies. Um, break them out by their nine points on the Enneagram. And let's say the CEO is an eight. And let's say that the chief of the maintenance department or not even the chief, just one of the, the new people brought on board who cleans up the building um, is also an eight and happens to maybe be a black woman. Mm. And they start talking. They start talking about how they raise their kids. Mm. They start talking about what they worry about. They start talking about how disrespectful it is when people break their trust. Mm. They start talking about you know, how people have always said they're too much, you know, and it is, in my language, a pure gift from God when I see the layers just sort of, the layers that would divide us, I, I see them start to fall. They start to fall away. And people are talking from their core essential self. Mm. They're talking from a place of realness, of authenticity about what matters to them, what's of value to them. And during those periods of time, 
It's not about who got what education, who, what color the skin is, how much money anybody makes. It's just about what's inside, what's, what's deep inside. And so if we could strip away all these layers of hierarchy and all of these things that, that divide us, and we can't, so we have to recognize we have to face those things. But the Enneagram is what brings people to the common ground. Yeah. They can find and see each other and then continue on the journey. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, you have been extremely effective in bringing more diversity to the Enneagram community. And I have benefited mm -hmm. in unimaginable ways, both directly and indirectly as a result of your work. What words of guidance would you offer to me and all the other people who are being called to this Enneagram space by you? Heal yourself first. Heal yourself first. It's the most important thing that you will ever do in your life because a wounded love warrior is not as effective as a healed and whole love warrior. And that's another term that I use for all of us who are subjected to othering. We are love warriors because our greatest weapon will always be love, but we are warriors because we have to fight sometimes for basic human rights but we have to use love. And, you know, as I say to everyone, you may have to shoot that arrow, but be sure that you dip the quiver in love mm -hmm. before you release the bow. Ooh. I love it. I love it. Dr. E, um, how can we get in touch? Those who are listening, who want to learn more about your book and learn more about your work. Um, how can they contact you? Uh, pretty easy, Deborah Egerton, Egerton.com. So it's Deborah spelt the bi biblical way, D E B O R A H. And Egerton is E G E R T O N.com. Um, if you go to my website, everything that you need, the main thing is sign up for the newsletter. If you sign up for the newsletter, then you'll be constantly updated with where I'm speaking, what I'm teaching, what I'm doing, and with encouraging thoughts to, you know, get you through the day. So that's the best way to reach me. Dr. E, it's an honor, a pleasure. I thank you because, uh, you know, the first thing you said to me was, I got to help you get certified. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, and just being on this course, um, and even going to San Francisco. Um, I really appreciate the work of you, Milton, Chi Chi, and others who are blazing the way, blazing the way, Toya, Mickey, just all the wonderful people. So thank you so much for your time. You're so welcome. And uh, for anyone who wants the book, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold, it's there. <clears throat> but uh, one thing... Uh, that people keep reminding me to, to tell everyone is that um, the audiobook, I read it. So uh, while people love the, the book, apparently I've been putting some people to sleep at night. <laughs> 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 they listen to it because apparently I have that kind of a voice. So uh, if you want me whispering in your ear, <laughs> I have both versions and I've been listening to the audio book as well. <laughs> so thank you so much. This is Totem Confidence Podcast Season 3 kicked off with Dr. E. This cannot be the last time you're well, on the show. It will not be. Just call me. Uh, what is that song? You just call, reach out a hand and you know that I'll be there. I'll come running. <laughs> if it's spring, summer, or fall, all you've got to do is call, and I'll be there. You've Thank got you. to <laughs> Thank you. And the same here. Anything you need of me. This is Total Confidence Podcast. Dr. Deborah Egerton. Get the book. It is on Amazon. I am listening to it on Audible, and I have the physical copy. And 
if you're interested in Enneagram work, look at her website. We're bringing more diversity there. Uh, man, it was amazing. Uh, San Francisco and people of color that are there. So, but I can go on and on. Thank you so much, Doc. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye.